Let's go ahead and have a prayer as we begin our class this evening. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come humbly bound in your presence. We, we stand amazed. We stand in, in awe. We, we think back on our day and just uh, the simple fact that we, we, we live and we move and we are blessed just uh, seemingly infinitely every day with, with the, the things that surround us, the beauty of this world, the, the friends that we have, the, uh, the care that the, the spiritual family shows for one another, the, uh, the, the blessing of friendship and fellowship, and, and we're just astounded that you care so much for us. Heavenly Father, the, we, we thank you for all of those things uh, in, in a way that uh, our words simply can't contain, but, but fills our hearts. Heavenly Father, we, we, we're especially mindful of this period of time that you've given us uh, this evening to come and open up your words to lead us in your paths of right, to show us the, the way that we should walk in, in this world so that we can have that home in, in eternity with you. Be with each and every one uh, uh, involved in this study this evening. May our hearts be open, our minds ready to receive those things that you are willing to, to impart to us. Heavenly Father, we're especially mindful too of those who, who are unable to be here those who simply for physical uh, limitations cannot get out. We ask Heavenly Father you also be with those who have simply chosen not to be here to, to assemble with the saints and to be encouraged and to encourage. Give us the strength to, to reach out to them and lift them up and, and care for them. Heavenly Father we, we thank you for all that you do but especially your son. It's in his name we pray. And amen. All right. We are in the book of Ezekiel. Man, it's been a long time since we've done the Bible snapshots. Uh, I can't remember when the, the last one was. Uh, I think it was actually back uh, in the, either the first uh, week of June. No? Have we done some since then? I mean, it's been a while. It's been a long time. We had uh, vacation Bible school, and then uh, we were gone for a couple of Wednesdays uh, out west uh, during, of course, the Mexico mission trip. Uh, and then before that, uh, we had, uh, I did think we did one or two, and then we were gone like the week of camp. Uh, so the, the summer is just kind of a difficult time, uh, but it's a joyous time. We get a lot of work done. We get to see uh, just a, a lot of fruit being born from the efforts that we put into uh, all of the things that we do in the summer. So uh, it's a joyous time. But now we're kind of nearing that point where we're back uh, into the routine. Uh, kids are almost getting ready to go back to school. and. Things uh, kind of settle down and we can uh, get back uh, into our normal routine. And uh, we are beginning with the, the book of Ezekiel. Uh, and I believe I actually made a whole stack of these and set them out there and everybody took them. But um, my guess was that you probably didn't bring them tonight. Uh, so if you did, great. Uh, if you didn't, uh, they sh um, I believe Pam passed some around. You can just simply follow along. Uh, remember, we are just introducing the books as they appear uh, in the uh, kind of title page. Uh, in your Bible. We're not taking them chronologically. Uh, hopefully by now we've seen that uh, these books are not ordered chronologically. Uh, actually when you get to like Ezra and Nehemiah and the return from Jerusalem, you're pretty much near the end chronologically uh, of what the Bible has to tell us. Remember that, you know, Malachi, uh, who is the last writer, <clears throat> the last writer uh, in the Old Testament uh, was a contemporary uh, of those men who brought back uh, the Israelites to Egypt, not Egypt, to uh, Israel, uh, their land, their promised land, out of Babylon, uh, and helped them rebuild. Uh, and the prophets were right there with them, encouraging them, strengthening them, reminding them uh, about their obligations. Well, you know, Malachi uh, would have been, no doubt, in the later part of that, uh, but uh, near uh, the, the kind of uh, end of, uh, of all of that as they matured and uh, finally settled in, into the land. So chronologically, we've pretty much reached the end of the Old Testament. Uh, but um, whoever originally ordered the books um, kind of lumped these, them together, uh, so to speak. You ever wonder why sometimes we go through the various sections of Scripture and we categorize them? You know, for instance, we have the books of the law, uh, we have the, the Pentateuch, we have the books of prophets, uh, and so on and so forth, books of poetry. Well, you'll notice in your Bible, that's the way they're organized. Uh, you know, we have those books of the law, you know, they're kind of all up front there. Uh, then we have, you know, the books of history, and they're all kind of crammed together there. 
You know, we have, you know, of course, Samuel and Kings and Chronicles and Ezra and, you know, Nehemiah. They're all kind of jammed in together there. Then we have the wisdom literature or poetry, sometimes we call it. Uh, it's all kind of crammed together, you know, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Psalms of Solomon. Uh, and uh, depending on, you know, who you are and, you know, what version you take, Job either belongs in wisdom literature or uh, in his, uh, history. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those books, because it contains elements of both, that sometimes it's placed in either category. I typically place it with the wisdom uh, literature. But then the final section is prophets, and prophets are divided into two groups. You remember what those two groups are? Minor and major, right? And, and what's the difference between minor and major? Yeah, just pretty much the length of the book. I mean, you'll notice that the minor prophets are, are pretty small books. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of our minor prophets uh, is um, uh, the smallest book in the Old Testament, at least. Anybody remember which one that is? Uh, not Amos. Obadiah. Uh, Obadiah is uh, the smallest book of the Old Testament. Um, and he's a minor prophet. Uh, and, but, you know, when you read Obadiah, uh, it's an astounding book. Uh, as long as you kind of understand what's going on, you know, Obadiah was, uh, uh, he packs a lot into that very small book, uh, the very small book, uh, as do most of the prophets. Uh, but uh, anyhow, we have major prophets, we have minor prophets. Uh, you'll notice that the minor prophets are just shorter uh, than the major prophets. There really is no other distinction. Um, there are other prophets uh, in, mentioned in the Bible, the, the ones that wrote books. Uh, they're not the only prophets. For instance, Elijah and Elisha, they never wrote a book. Um, their history is contained in history books uh, in the Bible, uh, but they themselves never penned uh, anything. So sometimes we refer to these prophets, major and minor, uh, as a group, uh, as writing prophets. Uh, they were the writing prophets, uh, but there were plenty of other prophets in Scripture. Um, you know, you have Micaiah, Elijah, Elisha, and, you know, other unnamed prophets. We're told even that there were schools for prophets uh, in, in the Old Testament, uh, so there were a lot of prophets, a lot of prophets, um, <clears throat> you know, but Ezekiel was one of those prophets. Now, personally, I, I love the book of Ezekiel. Um, the prophets are one of my favorite sections of, of scripture. If I'm kind of picking a favorite section, um, I just uh, really, really like the prophets uh, because they have a lot of really powerful things to say, uh, a lot of powerful things to say. Uh, just... Um, uh, it was this morning. I like to get up and like to, you know, have a prayer and read, uh, you know, a daily scripture. And, uh, and um, I, I have a program that just picks one for me uh, because sometimes it's, you know, hard for me to pick. Uh, it seems like I'm always picking things for other people to listen to. So I figured I'd let someone else pick mine. Uh, so I have this program that picks it. Uh, and the one that it picked for me uh, is actually found uh, in the book of Isaiah uh, in chapter, you know, 40. And it's one that most of us, uh, most of us know. Um, and, and the prophets say things like this all the time, beginning with verse 30. Even youth shall faint and grow weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with, in, we, with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Um, and man, what a perfect day to, way to start my day. Uh, but the prophets are all the time saying things, you know, like that. Uh, and that's why I think uh, maybe I, you know, particularly enjoy, uh, you know, some of the prophets. But Ezekiel is really no different. Ezekiel has a lot of very good things uh, to say. Uh, and, um, well, let's just kind of run through the, uh, the program here, and then you can kind of share your thoughts uh, about the book. Remember, these are just introductions, uh, giving you the basic gist uh, of the idea, uh, when this prophet wrote, who he was writing to, uh, and what did he have to say, and, and why is it important for us uh, to, to know it. Um, the title that I've given the book of Ezekiel is Glory, Lost and Found. Uh, and of course, that's kind of a description that could fit many of the prophets as they write, uh, especially concerning God's people. Uh, these were a people that were blessed, and yet time and time again, uh, they, they stare that glory in the face, uh, and they dismiss it. Uh, they let it go. Uh, and of course, you know, many people do that same uh, that same thing. Uh, Ezekiel is, of course, the author. If you look at um, Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, In the thirteenth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was uh, among the exiles by Kibar Canal, 
The heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile uh, of King Jehoiachin. The way, <clears throat> excuse me, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land uh, of the Chaldeans by the Kibar Canal, uh, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Uh, so we kind of learned, number one, that Ezekiel is the writer. Uh, number two, that he's writing because the word of the Lord came to him. And number three, we, he's writing from the captivity. Uh, so Ezekiel is a prophet of the captivity. Um, he's standing by the river Kibar, uh, or the Kibar Canal as the ESV puts it, because he's been taken as an exile there. Okay? He's been taken as an exile. Now, Jeremiah would have been the prophet that was left behind. Uh, and uh, he did not go, um, you know, at least at first to, to, to Babylon, uh, but was left, um, left behind. Uh, ends up uh, more than likely in, in uh, you know, Egypt before uh, anywhere else. But this is written from captivity. Uh, the name Ezekiel means God strengthened me. Uh, Ezekiel was the son of a priest and often addressed uh, by God as the son uh, of man, the son of man. Now, there are only two people in the Bible that are ever referred to uh, as the Son of Man. The Son of Man. One of them is Ezekiel, and the other one is Jesus Christ. Uh, and it's kind of funny, uh, because actually, when it comes to this particular title, Ezekiel outweighs Jesus uh, 90 times uh, in um, his book. Uh, is um, Ezekiel referred to as uh, the Son of Man the Son of Man, uh, as opposed to Christ, uh, who bears that title about 80 times, about 80 times. But they're the only two individuals uh, that we can find throughout Scripture uh, that uh, are referred to as uh, the Son of Man. You know, now we have generic references, you know, sons of men or sons of man or, or things like that. But specifically speaking uh, of individuals, these are the only two. Um, Ezekiel is a very dramatic prophet. Uh, and uh, he becomes an actor of sorts uh, very often in his message to get across some of the ideas. Uh, and you're going to read or we'll read some of the things that he actually uh, does or has to do. Uh, and uh, it's kind of astounding. And this is probably another reason why I really like uh, Ezekiel. Uh, because um, I, I, don't, I don't know. Some of it is just very arduous. And the pictures that are painted... Uh, really enable you to put yourself in his shoes uh, and kind of see the, the horrible nature uh, of some of the things that the, the people had done. Um, also, um, some of them are, are actually kind of humorous, uh, in you know, my opinion. But, you know, because you got to wonder, why did God make him do that? You, you know, why, why did God, you, you know, overly dramatize this particular, you know, I event? Uh, and it, it's done so to, to the point, you know, and you may differ, um, but some of it is just kind of humorous. Um, he prophesied, uh, prophesied uh, uh, the destruction, uh, prophesied about from about seven years before the uh, destruction of Jerusalem until about 15 years after uh, the destruction, so, you know, 20, 22 years. Um, <clears throat> it should be 22 uh, but uh, for some reason, only two came. He was a contemporary of Jeremiah, uh, Daniel, and probably uh, Habakkuk and Obadiah. Uh, so when you read those other books, uh, when you're reading Jeremiah and Daniel uh, and Habakkuk and Obadiah, realize that, that these are all prophets who are living at the same time. They're all living at the same time, and they're all writing at the same time. Uh, and, uh, you know... I remember the first time that, that I actually realized that that was the case. You know, it wasn't, you know, here's my nation, I'm going to send one prophet. And then when he's done, I'm going to send another prophet. And then when he's done, I'm going to send, you know, when I realized that, you know, God was using this kind of multi-pronged approach, uh, it, it really hit me. Uh, because I realized, you know, uh, that number one, it, it just really displays the love that God had for these people. You, you know, one message was not going to be enough. Uh, but it also, to me... Uh, showed and recognized that, you know, uh, that God realizes who we are. And he realizes that sometimes we need multiple messages in different forms to, to actually impact us. What may impact your heart and move you deeply, to me might be, hmm, yeah, you know, whatever. 
You know, but then the next message is like, oh, wow. Okay, I get it now. Um, you know, I think God understands that about us. Uh, so he has multiple people writing, uh, not, not different messages, but just the same message approaching it from, you know, different angles. Uh, different angles in different ways. Uh, so I think uh, it really demonstrates something to us uh, about God and about how he approaches humanity. He really, really wants us to understand. He really, really wanted his people uh, to know and care that, you know, he lo- to know uh, that he cared for them and loved them deeply. Uh, so he sent multiple people. Um, so we've got all of these prophets uh, working uh, together, uh, living at the, at the same time uh, to try to bring about, you know, similar uh, results. Now the prophecies of Ezekiel are, are mainly confined uh, to Judah before the fall and the destruction. Uh, but, uh, you know, Ezekiel uh, does have 48 chapters, 1,273 uh, verses. Okay? So it is important to know that most of the prophecies, okay, when we think prophecies, we mean predictive prophecies. Uh, most of the predictive prophecies um, are about the time before, the, they're about the destruction, but they're spoken before the time of the destruction. Um, now, he lives for years after that, uh, but much of that is just simply speaking forth the Word of God. Prophecy has those two elements. I, have I ever explained this? You know, not, when we say prophecy, we don't always mean predictive prophecy. Uh, that, that's not, you know, like for instance, uh, in the New Testament, one of the spiritual gifts was prophesying. You know, um, and you figure, you know, so a lot of people were endowed with this gift. So, you know, people were constantly telling the future. Uh, and, and no, that's only part of, of what prophecy was about. Prophecy is divided into in two sections generally um, and without getting, you know, hyper technical. Uh, one part of it is that predictive element. And another part of it was just the prophet himself acting more like a preacher. Uh, if we could probably put it that way. You know, it was the preaching side of it. You know, it's just telling the people what God wants. Look, you're in your sin, you need to correct your sin. You know, now they were usually a little more flowery than that. Uh, and they usually had, you know, some kind of hard-hitting messages. Uh, but, um, you know, that's not predictive in nature. And, you know, when, when Elisha came to Ahab and said, No, Ahab, you've troubled Israel. And, and uh, you, you know... This is the case. Well, that's not predictive prophecy, but that's still prophecy. He's simply revealing the will of God uh, in the moment. Uh, or, as some people say, forth telling. Uh, being forthright about the word of God. Uh, so we have to realize that about prophecy. Uh, so the predictive part of Ezekiel's ministry is that seven-year period leading up to the destruction. Um, and then, you know, afterwards there are some... Uh, there are some, but uh, most of the predictive element takes place before uh, the destruction. Um, key chapter, key verse. Uh, I didn't pick a key verse, um, but it's somewhere in chapter 37. Chapter 37 is just one of those phenomenal uh, chapters in, in the Bible. Uh, and uh, if you go there and read it and, and realize what he's talking about, uh, then it's just this amazing picture uh, of um, you know God and His people uh, and salvation, uh, and salvation. Um, but let's go there and read just a little bit. Uh, it's most of us know about you know the dry bones rising again. There are several songs in our songbook that actually use uh, this particular uh, section of scripture kind of as their uh, jumping off point or, or main idea. Uh, but Let's begin at verse 1. He says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were many, very many, on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, 
I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live and I will lay sinews upon you and I will cause flesh to come upon you and cover uh, you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I uh, am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a sound and behold a rattling and the bones came together bone to, to its bone and I looked and behold there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. And he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as commanded, <clears throat> and breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We indeed, uh, we are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O uh, my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Okay, so what exactly is he talking about there? I mean, it's, it's a vision, number one. Okay, so it's a vision, so it's obviously kind of, it's a metaphor. It's, it's a whole bunch of symbols for something, right? Uh, so what is he talking about? Was Israel literally, you know, the, the dead of Israel? Uh, and now you'll notice this. It, he's in a valley, and the bones are scattered on top of the ground, right? Uh, and uh, you can't let that slide by. Um, when people die, we don't just kind of toss their bodies in the backyard and, you know, their bones just lay there, do we? We, we, would, we would be appalled by that. And, and we would consider that, you know, criminal. Uh, and just uh, a horrible atrocity, right? Well, it, it was no less so with these people. Uh, that would not have been a proper burial. Uh, and um, people who were buried like that, and there are several throughout Scripture, Scripture, um, who God says, and, and your bones will not, you know, lie with your father, so to speak, uh, but, you, you know, you'll receive no proper burial. Uh, and that's one of the things that God uh, curses a, a few, very few people, uh, with, uh, but this uh, it speaks to, I, I believe, that their shame. Uh, it speaks to their sinful past. Uh, they didn't even receive a proper burial. Their bones are just scattered about in this valley like trash, like trash. Uh, and um, it's because of their past, and it's because uh, of, uh, you know, their sin had brought the, this to them. So how is it they're going to live? I mean, were all of these dead people of, of Israel past, they were going to rise again and, and walk around on the earth? Is he being literal? Is he saying that this is literally going to happen? No, he's not, it's not literal. So if it's not literal, then what does it figuratively mean? I know Joyce knows. What's it mean, Joyce? <laughs> No, I, it's okay. Oh, I'm right there with you. I agree wholeheartedly. Oh, yeah. I agree wholeheartedly, and I would think that... I, I, I would think that, you know, if we make a more general application of it, you know, because, I mean, let's face it, people of all ages are going to read this, right? You know, and, and I think that, number one, it, it speaks of God's power uh, to bring us to life from anything. I mean, these aren't just bones, right? They're not just bones. You know, you, you know bones that are you know, properly, uh, you, you know, embalmed and, and kept in a, in a grave and preserved. And, you know, years later, people can actually dig those up uh, and, and you can get enough DNA to figure out who that person is. 
you take a bone and you throw it out in the middle of a desert. You ever, you've been to the desert? You know, it was amazing. This year we went to Death Valley. And, and I thought, you know, it's Death Valley. I mean, they say it's hot. As we drove in, about every 10 miles it got a degree hotter. A degree hotter. Uh, it set a record temperature, 134 degrees, without the heat index. Um, not our year we were there, but a previous year. Uh, but it set, uh, you know, I think it's a record, you know, but I mean 134 degrees. It was 106 when we were there, just the raw temperature. You take a bone and you stick it out in, in that type of climate, and there's not going to be much left. In other words, the, the whole point of the dry bones is that there's no life left in it at all. There's no life left in it. Now, personally, and again, you may not agree with me, I, I think that we could draw a parallel between this chapter uh, and what Paul writes in the New Testament. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. But what? But he, the King James Version says he quickened you. Uh, or, to put it a little bit clearer, is he made you alive, basically, through his son. Through his son. You see, those people who got up and walked around on the day of the, you know, or, or surrounding the resurrection there, uh, I mean, that was a figure too. Uh, and you tie that all the way back here, and we're talking about God's ability to make you live. You know, there's more to, the, there's more to living than just this life. Uh, and I, I think that's part, the big part of the message. A uh, big part of the message that, um, you know, Ezekiel has in mind, especially for us. Um, you know, so it's a powerful thing. It's a powerful chapter. Uh, and I think it's just uh, kind of this, this prophecy that, you know, speaks to, to people, uh, you, you know, uh, of that time. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, their captivity, of course. Uh, but I think it uh, also speaks to us about, you know, God's power to, to, to bring his people uh, alive. Uh, and, you know... Uh, and give us hope. But anyhow, that's chapter 37. That's chapter 37. Uh, and uh, well, it's not all of it. You know, there's more to it, obviously. But um, that's the, the valley of the, the dry bones uh, and the prophecy there. Key words, key phrases. Uh, one of the key words is going to be vision. It's used over and over and over. Uh, and um, you'll notice that among the prophets. Not all prophets receive visions, but some prophets do. Uh, God comes to them. Uh, Ezekiel is a real big one. You know, um, we, we had that one song, uh, I haven't sang it in years, but it talks about how Ezekiel saw the wheel, you, you know, and the wheels in the middle of the wheel uh, and all of that. Well, God comes to Ezekiel a lot with a lot of visions, uh, a lot of visions. Um, another one uh, is going to be, uh, you shall know that I am the Lord. This phrase or similar phrases occur 60 times, uh, 60 times in, in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, you shall know that I am the Lord. You shall know that I am the Lord. He's going to do something and you shall know uh, that he is the Lord. Uh, and then, of course, the key thought is the glory uh, of the Lord. Go back to chapter 1 just very quickly. Um, I'm going to read just uh, one passage. Uh, one passage. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave some of those for, for you to read. <clears throat> He says, like the appearance of the, uh, of the bow that is in the cloud, on, or yeah, the bow that is in the cloud on the day uh, of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one uh, speaking. Uh, chapter 10 and verse 4, chapter uh, and verse 18, chapter 43 and verse 2, and there are a few others, talk uh, about the glory of the Lord. Uh, the glory of the Lord. Um, and uh, perhaps uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, saddest uh, uh, verses uh, in, in the Bible uh, is where uh, the glory of the Lord departs the temple. Uh, he, he leaves, and it's just this, I, again, when you realize what's happening there, it, it's God leaving his people because they are, they've just become wicked and vile. Uh, and it's just uh, heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Uh, but anyhow, the book, uh, uh, book kind of stands uh, at a turning point of history, uh, of biblical prophecy. Uh, in, in part, it has to do with uh, Ezekiel standing on the cusp between um, the predominant uh, kind of uh, pre, 
um, exilic message. In other words, they're about to go into captivity. Uh, they're about to go into captivity. Uh, and then, of course, you're going to have those prophets that come after, you know, um, captivity. And I'll let you read that, uh, that paragraph later. That's actually from the introduction uh, to Ezekiel in the ESV. Uh, it's got some good information uh, in there, um, but uh, you can read it. But for the sake of time, we're not going to actually read uh, through that. Outline of the book, um, chapter 1 through chapter 3, verse 15, is God calling uh, Ezekiel and kind of laying out uh, what he wants uh, Ezekiel to do. Um, chapter, or excuse me, chapter 3 through uh, chapter 7, thereabouts. Uh, is the carrying out uh, of Ezekiel's commission. That's where a lot of that prophecy, predictive prophecy, is going to take place. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have the rejection uh, of the people, um, idol worship um, detailed, uh, and then uh, the glory of the Lord uh, departs uh, from the people, chapters 8 through uh, 11. Uh, the people have their sins rebuked, uh, the nature of their judgment and their guilt, chapter 20 through 24. Uh, judgment uh, on the seven heathen nations. Uh, chapter 25 through 32, um, <clears throat> it departs from Israel, and, and uh, Ezekiel judges the other nations. Oh, why do you think God does that? Why do you think God does that? I mean, this is a book that's primarily about, you know, primarily about God's people uh, and their history and, you know, rejection uh, of him and the consequences that are going to come. Uh, but then their hope. Uh, their hope at the end of it all. So, so why do you think he departs from that and details these other nations? I mean, it's a good chunk, right? There's seven chapters. You know, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, you know, yeah, eight chapters actually, uh, that he details these punishments for other nations. Why do, you, why do you think he does that? I mean, I, you know, I don't have an answer in mind per se. I just... Throwing the question out there. Okay. Yeah, I think any time any time where God looks uh, and sees, you know, that, that sin taking place, you know, he's going to correct it. Uh, he's going to correct it. You know, back in, I think it was the, the writer of Chronicles, he talks about, you know, the eyes of the Lord. Remember this passage? The eyes of the Lord run to and fro um, on, on the earth uh, to find out those, uh, all right, to ex find out those whose hearts are truly his. I think that's how it's worded. Uh, but, you know, God sees all nations, you know, and sometimes we kind of get, you know, Israel, 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 Israel. We got the blinders sort of on and we're so focused on that, and, and rightfully so, because it's primarily about them and about them being the vehicle to bring Christ into the world, uh, you know, for salvation. But these other nations are dealt with too. Uh, why? Well, because some of them were very wicked and vile, and God wasn't about to let that pass. You know, he's not uh, about to, you know, uh, let, that, um, let that be known. Was that passage away? Jose, I thought you were making commentary there for a second. Okay. <laughs> But, uh, you know, God's not going to let that pass. And I think that's, uh, you know, a perfect answer. Uh, but I think also, you know, it's not just about judgment. You know, God is concerned about them. Uh, you know, for instance, Jonah. Jonah wasn't sent to tell them, you know, look, uh, no matter what you do, no matter what's going to happen, because you're not God's people, you're going to be destroyed. That's not the message he gave him, was it? Now, the message he gave him was about, a, you know, at least our rendition of it is about a sentence long. Uh, you know, uh, repent or is it, or what is it? Repent or in 40 days you'll be destroyed? I mean, it's, it's, it's like something like that. I can't remember the exact number of days, but that's basically the message of Jonah. You know, but God gives them a chance. Matter of fact, Jonah gets all mad because God won't toss the fire down upon them. Uh, and those people repent and they come around for a while. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, by the time we get to the book of Nahum, yeah, you, you know, it, it didn't last that long. Uh, but, um, you know, God does care about these folks in, in other nations. Uh, and uh, he, he does care about the, the, quote, Gentile, you know, world. I mean, let's face it, uh, when we hit the New Testament, this is all going to be lumped together. You know, one of the big messages of Christ was, you know, the kingdom is for everybody. 
You know, there's no middle wall partition anymore. You know, this kingdom is, you know, is beyond your borders. You know, it's not Jew and Gentile anymore. It's not, you know, uh, Eastern and Western. It's not European and American. You, you know, it's, you know, kingdom of God and everything else just kind of pales in comparison. Uh, you, you are a member of the kingdom first. Uh, so to me, that's kind of one of the, the secondary you know, messages. Anybody, any other thoughts about God you know, kind of going off. Well, I think it would have been re re reassuring to these people, too. Um, you, you know, they know the people are wicked. They, they know that these nations are, are horrible nations. Uh, and, you know, God's punishing them for them, their sins. Well, what about these the other nations? Well, God is just, and he is going to punish them as well. You know, he, he does it on his timetable. Jose, do you have something? Well, yeah, he's just talking about the other nations and them uh, receiving their just reward, so to speak. Right. Yeah, that's the gist of it. Right. Yeah, he, he does. I mean, you know, again, it's eight chapters, uh, you know, thereabouts. I mean, uh, that he deals with this. Uh, and it's interesting to go through and read uh, and uh, consider that, uh, especially if you know kind of the history of some of those places. Um, but um, he, he has a lot to, to say about, uh, a lot to say about them. Uh, if you flip the sheet over on the back side, we're going to take a quick look at uh, some of the, the prophecies. I'm just going to list them very quickly because I want to get to the next section um, and, and for sure. Um, but, you know, prophecies of Ezekiel, he talks about Edom in chapter 25, verses 12 through 14. Uh, again, that's one of those nations that's going to be destroyed. Uh, they are the nation that was, you know, set high on the precipice and, you know, and all of that. And uh, you have Tyre. Uh, you have Tyre. Uh, being, uh, you know, prophesied uh, about, and there's a little paragraph there about that. Uh, their history is very, uh, very interesting. Uh, Sidon, which, of course, uh, is sort of a, you know, sister city to, you know, Tyre. Uh, you have the dry bones prophecy. You have uh, the Gog uh, in 38. Uh, and you have the sealed gate, uh, chapter 44, verses 1 through 3. Uh, you know, all of those have that uh, prophetic, you know, element uh, to them uh, outside of the many of the prophecies about to God's own people about their uh, destructions. Um, but I want to look at the next section because to me it's the thing that really, really makes Ezekiel in, unique. Um, there are signs that uh, God called him to act out um, in, in front of the people. And, and it was God's, uh, at least I believe, intention, because I can't figure out you know, any other intention, uh, to simply get the attention of the people. Uh, you know, uh, let's just kind of look at them and it's sort of self explanatory. Um, uh, at times, uh, the prophet was seemingly uh, stricken speechless uh, or mute uh, and had to use sign language. Uh, he had to use sign language. Um, he gave uh, 10 messages in sign language uh, in the first uh, 24 chapters, uh, apparently. Uh, and um, that's just one of the things. Uh, you have uh, the sign of the tile. Uh, if you go back to, if you go forward, I guess, to chapter 4. He says, the son of man, take a brick and lay it before you and engrave on it a city, even Jerusalem, and put siege works against it and build a siege wall against it and cast up a mound against it, set camps also against it and, and plant battering rams against it all around. And you take an iron uh, griddle and place it uh, as an iron wall between you and the city and set your face toward it, toward it and let it be in a state of siege and press the siege against it. This is a sign for the house uh, of Israel. You know, so you can almost picture this scene in your head where God is, is making him build this, what seems to be kids' little play fort type thing. Uh, and, you know, he's got a tile and he's supposed to put a city on it. And, and then he's supposed to lay siege to this city. Uh, and, um, you know, there's nothing about the context that, that would indicate that God was just simply being facetious. 
or, or didn't really want him to do that. Uh, God is literally asking him to, to do this uh, in front of the people, you know, so they would uh, see it. Um, another place, chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Uh, for a whole year he had to lie, first on one side and then on the other side. Uh, you know, and it, uh, then he had to eat loathsome food, uh, also in chapter 4. Um, we have another sign, the sign of the razor and the fire. He had to pack his bags and, and literally move. Uh, and this one's uh, an interesting one. Go to chapter 12. And again, I hate to run through these. Uh, but um, chapter 12, beginning in the verse, um, verse uh, well, let's not start at 1. Uh, let's start at verse 2. Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious, rebellious house, who have, who have, whose eyes, who have eyes to see, uh, but see not, who have ears to hear, but hear not, for they are a rebellious house. As for you, son of man, prepare for yourself an exile's bag, and go into exile by day in their sight. You shall go like an exile from the place, t- uh, from your place to another place in their sight. Perhaps they will understand, though they are a rebellious house. You shall bring out your baggage by day in their sight, a baggage for exile, and you shall go out uh, yourself at evening in their sight, and those uh, who must go, uh, uh, as those who must go into exile. In their sight, dig through the wall and bring your baggage out through it. In their sight, you shall lift the baggage upon your shoulder and carry it out at dusk. And you shall cover your face that you may not see the land. For I have made you a sign for the house of Israel. He has to act all of this out. He's got to go out and dig a hole through the wall like he's escaping from prison. Uh, and, you know, at, at night. Uh, all to kind of depict for them, this is what's going to happen to you. That's what's going to happen to you uh, if you don't pull it together. Okay? Um, then uh, he's got uh, the, his sign. Uh, he has to clap his hands. There's the sign of the pot. Uh, and then w- one of the ones that kind of breaks your heart is uh, his wife dies. Uh, and, and God does not allow him to mourn. Uh, God does not allow him to, to mourn for his uh, dead wife. Um, but his uh, prophecies uh, all contain these kind of symbolic uh, elements. Uh, and uh, again, the thing that kind of makes him unique is he, he has to act out a lot of these things in front of the people. Um, now, Jeremiah had some of these you know, elements where he talks about the potter and the clay. And he had to go down and observe that. Uh, and there were some unique things about that. But Ezekiel, um, a lot of the pro- prophecies that people are supposed to get, um, were not only a message, but they were a message uh, in, in uh, almost a play-like format. Uh, it was kind of played out in, in front of them by some sort of action uh, on Ezekiel's part. Uh, so that makes uh, Ezekiel, you know, kind of uh, a little different than the rest uh, of the prophets. Any, any questions or comments? I don't know if anybody's going to ring the bell or not, but there we go. There we go. I, well, I mean, God is coming to them and telling them, write my word. Uh, God is uh, calling them. Um, you know, some people are, are people that, uh, you know, they weren't prophets, nor were they sons of prophets. Uh, God just simply, you know, called them, uh, called them. I, I believe it's, um, let, me, let me go there and make sure before I say it. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Amos, uh, which um, I think Joyce mentioned earlier. Um, it, it's the opening words of Amos are uh, the words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, uh, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, uh, and in the days of uh, Jeroboam, the son of Joah. So here's a guy who seemingly is a shepherd, and he's there among the shepherds, um, uh, you know, and God comes to him and shows him this. Uh, so, you know. What system does God use to, to pick these individuals? Well, that, it's, all I can really say is God's, that's God's prerogative. You know, um, he knows, but he doesn't necessarily reveal that other than that we know that, you know, God sees the hearts of individuals. And, you know, and of course, part of it is right place, right time, too. You know, God putting them there. So, any other comments? Sure. And what should I be learning from Ezekiel? From Ezekiel? 
Well, there's a lot of different messages we can learn, you know, from uh, Ezekiel. There are, if you look at the last three things on the page there, to me those are the biggest lessons. You can sum up Ezekiel with uh, three basic events. The departure of God's glory. If we are not living righteous lives, uh, if we are not seeking his will, uh, then God is not with us. You know, in, in the sense that, you know, um, we're going to have the benefit of being his children. We're going to have that, that salvation uh, and that hope. Um, you, you know, God de departs. Um, you, you know, <clears throat> in him there, there is no, you know, darkness. God is light and there is no darkness in him. Um, you, you know, and when we become darkness, he, he departs. Uh, I think is one of the big messages. The second one uh, is the fall of uh, Jerusalem. They, eventually there was a judgment and the patience of God ran out. God will be patient with you uh, as an individual. And he wants you to live and he wants to breathe that life into you and he wants you to, to accept him, but there will be a judgment. Uh, and that judgment will be followed by destruction. Uh, and then the final thing I think he tells us uh, is that there's a return of the glory uh, of the Lord. You know, no matter where you are in, in your life, no matter what your struggle is, no matter what you've done in your past, God can make you live again. The glory uh, that he is can come back into you uh, and you can be restored. And I think those are the three big messages. Yeah. Appreciate everybody's attention uh, and input. In the book of Exodus, <clears throat> in the book of Exodus, in chapter 16 and verse 31, uh, the Bible reads, And the house of Israel called its name manna, <clears throat> and it was like white coriander seed, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And we all know the story, and we've been taught it from the time we were little children, uh, about the manna and about the quail and how God provided those things in the, the wilderness. Uh, and, and we understand that when God provided those things in the wilderness, the, the, the children, or they were provided because the people were complaining. The people were complaining about their food. But then you'll, you'll notice once God does provide it, they go on for a little time doing rather well, but then what do they do? They begin complaining again uh, about the food. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, the food, uh, or I guess the, the manna, so to speak, in, in, the literal, in the language literally means, in the Hebrew language literally means, what is it? Uh, what is it? That, that's what manna means. You know, we think, oh, manna from heaven. And it literally means, what is it? Um, but the, the people murmured after a while uh, about it. And, and it made me think of something. As I read the, those verses last week, uh, preparing for a, a different lesson, it made me think about uh, what Christ said in the New Testament. When he talked about that he was the true bread from heaven. And, and I thought about that for a while and, and kind of tried to put the, it in the similar context. And, and I began to realize that here is the bread of heaven come down from God. God designed uh, <clears throat> the ministry of Christ. God sent his son into this world to feed the world spiritually so that they might live. And, and yet, what did they do about it? They complained. They murmured. And you know what? That's a tradition that continues on in perpetuity. Even into our day and age. You know, we see it all the time. Hopefully we're not like that. Hopefully in our hearts we have determined to always consider all, all and, and only the, the blessings of God. And, and hopefully part of our reasoning is very simply this. Because the same Christ who came and said that he was the bread from heaven told us that we must be a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Have become new. And I thought for just a minute about the manna again. And do you remember how many days of manna they were supposed to collect at a time? One. One. And if they collected more than one, what happened? It would rot. It would rot. And I can't help but think that the rottenness here sort of parallels their murmuring and their complaining and their attitudes. Sometimes attitudes can not only rot us from the inside, but spread to other people and affect them a, a, as well. You know, each day is a new day, I think, is part of what God is saying. 
Each day is a day that we can exercise the fact that we are a new creature in Him. That we are a new creation and He is blessing us yet again with another day. Why look back to the old man and see the rottenness that's there? And once again, go back to the rottenness that is the murmuring, complaining person outside of God's fold of safety. Why go back there? Positive attitudes make a big, big difference. What is it? Well, I think we know what it is, right? We choose it each and every day. Either we are that new creation or we are that rotting manna. We are his or we are slowly in our hearts moving away from him. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never given yourself over to him. Maybe you've not become that new creature, that new creation. Put on that new man. You don't have that relationship with him yet. Why wait? Why not make it tonight? Commit your life to him. Say, tell him I, uh, you believe. Repent of your sins. Confess that Christ is the Son of the living God. Enter into the waters of baptism and let him wash you clean. Well, maybe you've done that and tonight you're just struggling with something. Why not bring that too? There's no one more powerful than God to help you. And he sent forth each and every one of us to be shoulders to lean on, cry on, to help you. So if you're here tonight and you're struggling or you need to return or you confess a fault, come as together we stand and sing.